All right, welcome back, class. Right now, we're going to dig into um, a very important balance that we overlook a lot in the American church. It doesn't matter whether you're the preacher, an elder, somebody on staff, a lay leader, somebody who just goes to church and gets excited about stuff. We, we struggle to balance ministry and spiritual formation, spiritual development. And part of that is because we misunderstand where, uh, where in which the power of ministry really comes from. And so I want to spend a little bit of time talking about that. Uh, as you can see over here to my side, uh, I have a, a wagon wheel. It's not an actual wagon wheel. You've probably seen one of these. It's, it's something you'd find like in a... Uh, Hobby Lobby or Michael's or Craft Store. Uh, I was walking through the store one day and I saw this, this replica of a wagon wheel. And I was reminded about a, a lesson that one of my favorite authors, uh, the late Henry Nowen, shared in a book called Spiritual Formation. It was released from his own notes and writings that, that hadn't been released yet. Uh, they were discovered by some of his students and people involved in the Henry Nowen Society, and they thought they were so good, they would publish them. And uh, it was a very valuable book. You might check it out sometime. But he, he practiced this, this uh, spiritual discipline of visio divina. And that is allowing ourselves to contemplate what we see. And so a work of art beautiful architecture, uh, nature, or something as mundane as a wagon wheel, and looking for how we might see God using this to speak to us. And you might say, well, what in the world could God say through a wagon wheel? Well, let, let me illustrate for you. I want you to contemplate this question. What is the most important part of a wagon wheel? Okay, there's, there's the wheel itself on the outside where it touches the ground and, and you won't move if that's the case. You know, your wagon will not move if this part does not touch the ground. But then there's the spokes here and it supports the entire structure. But then finally you have the hub. The hub is what connects the wheel to the axle so that it works in connection with all the other wheels. And it takes you where you're going. Well, what Nowen shares, and I, I agree with him, that the hub is really the heart and the most important part of the wheel. You see, it, it holds all the spokes together and the spokes support everything that's going on where the where the wheel meets the road. If you take out the hub, there is no wheel. It doesn't function. It can't move forward. And it cannot be connected to the rest of the wagon. It's an integral part of everything that makes it a wheel. Now let's identify these parts from a spiritual perspective. The hub is going to be your most important relationship. The relationship that holds all things together by the power of its word. Well, we know from both the book of Colossians chapter 1 verse 3 and Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3, well, that's Jesus. Jesus is our hub. And he holds all things together by the power of his word. These spokes here that, that support everything, well, these are our relationships, our friends, our family, our coworkers, our classmates. They're the people on staff at the church. They're the people you run into at the grocery store. They're every type of relationship you have. And finally, you have the wheel. And the wheel is life. It's ministry. It's where activities happen in day-to-day -day life. Whether they be planned activities and in, in such as uh, a ministry or a job, or just the happenstance meetings with people in the park. 
in the American church world, we tend to start on the outside. We think about the results that we want to have happen, the type of ministry that we're going to lead. And then we start naming the activities that we're going to be about doing. We're going to have a youth group, and we're going to have a children's ministry. We're going to have a senior adults ministry, and we're going to do these things. We're going to have a movie night. We're going to have a, a, a great concert. We're going to, we're going to provide uh, services to, the, to those in need. We're, we're going to, uh, I don't know, provide a, a grocery delivery service, or, or we're going to help with Meals on Wheels. We're, we're going to do all these things. And I don't think any of those things are wrong. But you start by, if you start out here with this plan, the next thing you got to do is we're going to go find the people. We're going to recruit the people to be part of our thing. The activity is what's driving the relationships. And then say, okay, now let's, you know, we, we think this, this is a good thing. Now let's pray about it. Let's go talk to Jesus about this. The problem is, is that this is not how we see Jesus doing ministry at all. You know, multiple occasions, the Apostle Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Well, if we're imitating Christ, if we're following that pattern, then we should be looking at how Jesus did ministry and then go from there and, and, and see how it plays out. So what I see from Jesus, we find him in Mark chapter 1. He gets up very early in the morning to have a time of solitude, a time alone with his Father to pray. What he's doing there is he is attending to his hub. He's going in there. He's like, I am going to commune with my Father and I'm going to talk about what I'm going to do. I'm going to get marching orders from him. And then his disciples, they don't see him in the morning and they go looking for him. And they say, Jesus, we were wondering where you are. Everybody's coming to see you. We're wondering where you went. We couldn't find you. So let's, let's stay here and you can teach lots of people. And he says, well, no. No, we need to go throughout Israel to a number of towns. I, I've got lots of people to share the good news with. I need to tell them about the kingdom. So Jesus comes out of his hub and he says that he and his disciples, his disciples need to go and do ministry sharing the gospel message. Hub, spokes, activity, the wheel, ministry. He started in his hub. We see this again later on when Jesus, he goes up on a mountain to pray all night. And when he comes down from the mountain, the next day, he assigns his, his apostles. He names 12 men to be his emissaries, his apostles, his messengers, carrying his message. And, and he gives them very specific instructions how to do that and what this message is. It's continuing his ministry. So he goes into his hub, spends all night in solitude, in prayer, talking to his father, and then he comes down off the mountain the next morning and he chooses the relationships who are going to be part of this ministry and then casts the vision for them of what they're going to be doing. He in instructs them what the ministry itself, what the wheel that they're going to be about moving along is going to be doing. He even does this the night he's arrested. He's shattered. He's quaking. He's, his body, you can almost feel the tension in it. As he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, and he takes some of his disciples a little bit further with him, and he asks them to pray with him. But he goes deeper for this deeper time of solitude, a deeper time of prayer, and he prays to his father. He pleads, if there's any other way, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, yours be done. And then he comes back and 
the people that he brought with him to have this time of prayer, they're sleeping. He wakes them up. They're the spokes. He says, this is what we need to be doing. We need to be praying. And he reminds them of this. And he goes back and he prays. And this happens a, a couple more times. But ultimately, out of that prayer, he is solidified on his mission that he is here to be taken by those who've come to betray him, Judas, the soldiers who were there to arrest him. And he allows himself to submit to those spokes, those relationships, whether they're close or distant, so that ultimately the ministry of God through his death, burial, and resurrection can take place. This is how Jesus did ministry. So I want to ask you, when you start planning a ministry, do you begin with the activity or do you begin at the hub? Because if we begin with the activity, it's, it's really on us. It's really on us to be super creative and figure out all the, the master plans. Now, there's room for organization. There's important things about leadership strategies and all that type of stuff. But if it just begins there, it's really hard to come around and redeem it. But if the ministry activity and, and the direction of the relationships of our lives begin here in the hub, then Jesus is the one who's steering the wagon. He's the one who's guiding us through those relationships and into ministry activity. Not things that we orchestrated, but divine appointments that he's readied our heart for. So what, what am I talking about in solitude? You know, when I mention that Jesus seeks out solitude to spend time in the hub, well, I'm, I'm talking about meeting with Jesus to be a, a, alone with him. Not to be lonely, but to be alone with God, to be alone with Jesus, and to open our hearts and our soul to Him, allowing Him to shape our mind. This is a wonderful time to maybe have a specific scripture to be meditating upon, contemplating the words as we read through it three or four times slowly, maybe reading them aloud, a, a personal Lectio Divina, holy reading practice. But then allowing a significant time of silence where we just allow our, our mind to delve into our heart, to meet with Jesus as He reveals things about us and speaks into who we are. Now, when that happens, especially at first, once we really first start concentrating, one of the first things Jesus exposes to us are things that we might not think are pleasant. He begins to reveal spiritual shortcomings, areas of our life that he wants to, to change and reshape so that it, he can then equip us to embrace our, our identity as sons and daughters of God. But all this begins in the hub. And if we don't begin there... What do we have to offer to the relationships that Jesus is calling us to reach out to? I don't know about you, but there are a lot of places in my life where I know I don't measure up. I know that Jesus is not done with me. And it's one thing to say that. It's another thing to sit down, meditating on Scripture, maybe writing some thoughts in a journal, and simply listening to the Spirit begin to reveal those to me. This is where we begin to take the log out of our eye so that we can help our brothers and sisters take the speck out of theirs. It's the hard work of spiritual discernment and formation where we begin to think, begin to feel like Jesus and then reflect that into the heart and life of others. Sometimes it's not sin. Sometimes it's admitting our brokenness, admitting that we've been hurt, that we alone can't bring healing. And in that place, sitting with Jesus quietly in the silence, in the solitude, He breathes new life, new healing into us. 
whether it be a broken relationship, a failed ministry, who knows, overcoming a disease, whatever the struggle has been, this is a place where you've been wounded, hurt, struggled. And as you allow space for Jesus to speak into you, dwelling on your hub, what happens is he takes that brokenness and turns it into a ministry tool. We become wounded healers. We become advocates of the grace of Jesus working in our life and sharing our story with with the spokes, with the relationships that we have. Ministry begins to take place in a very organic way as we begin to walk together following Jesus. So have you noticed the difference between the two? Starting with the ministry plan and then turning around and trying to add prayer and spiritual disciplines to it? Or beginning in the hub and working out from there? Allowing Jesus to define our relationships and the ministry that comes from them. I'm going to leave you with that. Take some time and maybe work through What's really at your hub? Is it Jesus or something else? Who are the spokes, the relationships of your life, and what ministry is coming from them? Maybe ask the hard question. Are you starting with ministry, or are you starting with Jesus?